Okay, so you can title your notes, the book of Acts. And some people call it the Acts of the Apostles. I'd rather call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit, and you'll see why I say that. One of the uh, distinctive um, features of the postponement period is the uh, indwelling and regeneration of the believer. All right? when, I, when I say postponement, well, I'll pray in just a minute. When I say postponement period, I'm talking about the period of time for when Christ ascended until he comes back again. Uh, that is an undisclosed amount of time. We don't know how long it's going to be. And so it's kind of like an accordion where the time is being stretched out and stretched out and stretched out. And God, the Lord, because of his mercy, does not come back again. He's waiting for people to be saved. Second Peter says that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. So um, that's the postponement period. But during this time, the Lord established his institution of the church. And one of the distinctive qualities of the church, features, if you will, uh, is the unusual or unprecedented, maybe a better word, uh, rendering of uh, Holy, the Holy Spirit's operation in a believer. We know because of Ephesians chapter 1 and other places, First Peter, I think, talks about the indwelling of God's Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, after you received His Word, uh, you were uh, indwelt with that Holy Spirit of promise. It says also in Ephesians chapter 4, 3, that you, it is by that Spirit you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So if we have not the Spirit of God, we're upon your seal unto the day of redemption. So a believer, once believing, clearly through the Scriptures, that they are indwelt with God's Spirit, and they, that indwelling is all the way up until the day of redemption. That is a distinctive feature of the postponed period of the church age. So, because the, Acts, the book of Acts is a historical book, and because it's dealing with the church age, and we see, obviously, the Holy Spirit working in a very powerful way here, I think it's better to call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Acts of the Apostles is not at all divinely inspired. Okay, that's just something we call it. But it wasn't really the Apostles, it was God's Spirit. So we're going to read some of these passages. We're going to see how God's Spirit worked in, in, in the church back then, really in miraculous ways. And uh, so we'll begin, I'll pray in just a minute, we'll begin with the author of the book of Acts and some introductory material. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. I ask Lord that you bless us. Did you give us a good class time? We are thankful for your love for us, thankful that you give us this time together. Help us to be uh, awake, uh, enthusiastic, engaged in the class, thinking, and, and uh, maybe asking provocative questions and kind of sealing up some things that could be a doctrinal problem and, uh, regarding the book of Acts and the work of your spirit. And so thank you for the... Um, <clears throat> plainness of your word and for those that have studied before and have laid these things out and we could study also and, and it helps us in our own walk and be able to help others as well. And so bless our class time now. Give me wisdom. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's look at some things regarding the book of Acts. The author, the author is Luke, who happens to be the most um, prolific author of the New Testament. That is, he's written more pages than any other author. This is a continuation where the book of Luke leaves off. And so we have at the end of the book of Luke a <clears throat> the men on the road to Emmaus. And then it says verse 50 of Luke 24. And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and, and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple praising and blessing God. All right. Then the book of Acts, uh, it says in verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost was given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. All right. And it, it mentions him showing himself alive that many days to the apostles. So where the book of Luke ends up, ends up the Acts of the Apostles begins. We read verse 1, chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus. That in the Greek means uh, one who loves God or a lover of God. Theos, philos, uh, phileo, actually. This, has, this is the cognate for love, God and love. Okay, the God of love or the God, one who loves God. And uh, this, it says, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now, I don't remember if we covered that in this class, but the book of Luke, that gospel, as opposed to the other gospels, was written to reassure believers. Not so much written to give that information because there were others who had set in hand to give those things. And so the information was already being disseminated among the believers. But the book of Luke in particular was written for as, as a, as a uh, 
a, a book of assurance, that is, to, to reassure people that these things are true. And that is why Luke brings in a lot of dates, a lot of people, lots of information, extraneous, if you will, information that helps uh, to, to assure the believer on these things. Well, the book of Acts is no different. So Acts then is written in, in, in that way. It's written to Theophilus, could be a person, could be a group of people. But the theme then for the book of Acts is simply the continuation of Jesus' ministry among his people, in particular through the Holy Spirit. Now what did Jesus say when he, so that's the theme of Acts, uh, the continuation of Jesus' ministry through his people. What, what did uh, the Lord say? He said, it is expedient for you that I go. Because if I don't go, or if I go not, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. I will send him, and he will call you to, cause you to remember all things whatsoever I've, I, I have uh, commanded you, I think, or taught you. And so he says there that the, the uh, Holy Spirit was going to come, also known as the Comforter. And so he promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we see then in Acts that coming, and then we see how that has, was carried out. Um, let me just say this on the onset. We can assume that the indwelling and the, um, the sign gifts of, of the Spirit were uh, coincidental. Okay? And that the indwelling of God's Spirit also uh, now may have taken a period of time for that to be for every believer as the sign gifts were coincident. But they were coincidental. And um, the signs uh, that were done through God's Spirit was done in part to confirm the word. We said that, we saw that in the book of Mark. At the end of the book of Mark, it says there that confirming these, confirming the word, these signs and these gifts were given. And so in another part of the Bible, it's called, they're called the signs of the apostle. So these miraculous events, we'll get to them in a minute, of the Holy Spirit, the speaking in tongues, cloven tongues of fire, the mighty rushing wind, all of these things were given in part so that because God's word was being given. So it's coincidental with the giving of God's word and it buttressed or uh, backed up or was a, a base, a foundation or sign showing uh, that God's word is being given. And so the Jewish person would have known because they seek after signs uh, because in their Old Testament prophecy these things are given. And so it's a continuation of Jesus' ministry by his people through the promise of God's spirit. Okay. Um, we should or excuse me, uh, Matthew 28 says, now we're just giving introductory material, uh, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all, what's, uh, all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So uh, we are commanded to do essentially what Jesus did. Right? We're just commanded to do that as a church. Lots of things in the Bible that talk about us following the example of Christ. Uh, the apostles here did that. So we have a historical book showing us what they did. That ver those verses in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it says, Go ye and teach all nations. Actually, in the Greek, that means making disciples of all nations and then teaching them to observe all, all things. So although to translate it teaching all nations and teaching them to observe is not wrong, um, it, the Greek word has the idea of making disciples. All right? So, of course, you have to teach them to make disciples of them. So that's what the Lord told them, and he told them then to do the same thing he did. Lots of scriptures in the Bible that command us to do what Jesus did. Can anybody give me an example of what the Bible says that we should do what Jesus did? Now this is twofold. One, well, mostly to keep you awake. Okay, yes? To go and tell? Like what we said here? To go and tell people? Yeah, I mean, that's true. To go and do what Jesus did. What about something else? When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he said, do as I have done. Okay, do likewise. All right, so we should wash each other's feet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Right, good, yeah, do as, what, I, what I've done. Uh, what about Philippians chapter 2? We are told to be of the same mind that he is. Okay, so I think the same way. Be of the same mind. It says that we are his ambassadors in first Corinthians, Second Corinthians. So this idea to be an ambassador, an ambassador doesn't give his own words, he simply gives the words of, he is a representative of another, of another country. And so we, in a very real way, are ambassadors for Christ. We have the same mind. We're to do what he did. So we're to do the same work that he did. The works that I do, those that believe will do also, he says. So lots of things in the Bible. We're supposed to love as he loved. We're supposed to have his joy. Now we're supposed to follow him. We're supposed to be uh, like him. After all, the word Christian means, has the understanding of like Christ. All right, so this is kind of an introduction to the book of Acts. Luke started it. It's continued. Uh, 
excuse me, it's the, the ending of the book of Luke then is, is picked up with Acts there. We talked about the theme, the continuation of his ministry, and how it should be maybe better titled Acts of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, what is the key verse then that will kind of unlock this? And in truth, we could give us a basic outline of the book. Acts 1.8, eight. You probably memorized this before. But it says here, but, but ye shall receive power. All right, so power, this is dunamis in Greek. We get our word dynamic or dynamite from that. But ye shall receive power after that. The, now, notice, notice the, uh, uh, what he calls a clause, a time clause, isn't it? You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So this is a time clause here. So grammatically speaking, one event happens before the other one. What event happens here first? The Holy Ghost comes upon you, and then you'll have power. Power to do what? And you shall be, what does it say there? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. Now that would be witness for him, tell people about him, but also do what he does. And then it says in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the other most part of the earth. So really, this is what happens in the book of Acts. They start in Jerusalem, and then they go to Judea, and then Samaria with the preaching of Philip in Acts chapter 8, and then they go to the uttermost parts of the earth through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So really, this could be an outline to the book of Acts. Really, the first 12 verses deal with the uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samarian ministry of Peter, and then from 13 all the way to 28 would be the ministry of Paul. Okay, so, or foreign missions, if you will. <clears throat> okay. Um, very good. Any questions so far? I think I've given you most of the intro introductory material. Yes? Um, so if Luke, he, he wasn't one of Christ's disciples, so how would he have gotten the information? Like you said, he, he had a lot of the dates, he had a lot of extra information. I know through inspiration, obviously. Yeah. Where would that have come from? Would that have come from his interaction with the other disciples? Uh, he wasn't there. Yeah, well, certainly. I, I think what we can say regarding that is that he could have studied those things, and he could have been there, and he could have known it, but he was permitted to give that information in scriptural form by God's Spirit. Yeah. So he may have known it. Was he given that through his own knowledge or through the knowledge of, of directly through the knowledge of God? You know, I don't know, but he was certainly permitted to write these. What, what is written here, no more, no less, uh, through the Spirit of God to be in Scripture. I'm, he probably wrote some other things that weren't Scripture, but the distinct thing here is that uh, he is, because it says here he was taken up a hand. Okay, let's go to the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 1, or verse, yes, chapter 1. So it says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. All right, so what is he saying here? That here there's a lot of different people, apparently, it says many, have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration. So they've declared it, um, whether oral or written. The point is, is that it was declared. It's known. And so Luke was writing at a time where a lot of people were, were taking up hand to write these things. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. All right, so Luke here is saying that there are people who are eyewitnesses and ministers, ministers of the word, eyewitnesses of the ministry of Christ, and they delivered those words to them. Verse 3, each saying good to me also, having had perfect understanding. Okay, now that phrase, having had perfect understanding, this would be, as it says, of all things from the very first. This is where I believe Luke is claiming inspiration. Because how can he, as a man, have perfect understanding? So I think in verse 3 there, I think he's telling us, um, through again, through God's Spirit, that what he's written here, what he's taken at hand to write in this gospel, it regards the perfect understanding of God. And then it says, verse 4, that thou mightest know the certainty of these things, and he gives us the purpose for it. So I think we can conclude that certainly everything that's written in this book was allowed by God, whether or not he knew that information or not. And those are some of the details that we, I guess we can't totally know for certain all of those things. Does that answer your question? Anything else? Yes? Uh, I just wanted to clarify the fact of Luke's, um, I think he actually just asked the same question. Luke's uh, purpose for writing? Yeah, his purpose for yeah writing. so that's what I just went through there. And so the Acts picks up where Luke, le Luke left off. Um, apparently there were two separate writings, I suppose, as we, as we have two separate books. But uh, the Lord ascends, that's the end of the book of Luke, and then the Holy Spirit descends, essentially the beginning of the book of Acts. So we see uh, the, the fulfillment of the promise that Christ gave, the promise of the Father.
Uh, there's a tons of doctrine and all that. I'm just this is a survey course, so we're just kind of going through it. But well, those are good questions. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, it's good that you have a real clear understanding of the book of Acts and why it was written, by who and all of that. Very good. Then we'll just go through the highlights in the book of Acts. We'll t take every chapter in hand there, and we'll, ch and we'll just kind of go through it that way. All right, so chapter 1. We're going to call this uh, transition. I don't, I'm not saying we're going to go through every single chapter, but sometimes we'll group a couple, chap excuse me, a couple chapters together. But Acts chapter 1 we'll call a transition. All right. Uh, we're back in the book of Acts there. Verse 3. So we talked about the first two. Uh, to whom also he showed himself. Who showed himself? What well, the Lord did. Alive after his passion. So what is he saying here? That he had died and he was alive again. And it says by many infallible proofs. So there are proofs that he gave when he was alive after he, had, uh, after he was dead. That... Um, that came about during that time. Infallible. No question. Absolutely perfect. Being seen of them, being seen of who? The apostles and those. Forty days, actually more than the apostles, because it said that he appeared, I think it's later on in the, in the chapter here, to 500 people at once. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Okay, so um, here again, we, uh, Luke is claiming inspiration in his writing. This idea of the infallible proofs. Okay. So I think he's claiming that inspiration again. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So this is when the Lord uh, appeared among the apostles. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he appeared more than once. He appeared one time, then Thomas wasn't there, and he appeared again, Thomas was there. Um, so he said, wait for the promise of the Father. Now it's very important. I'm going to carry you all the way through to, uh, oh... 14, all right, so we're going to walk through. It says, wait for the promise of the Father. Okay, now, it's very, very important. Because you might ask yourself, reading verse 4, what promise of the Father? Well, he tells us, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water. What John is he talking about? Obviously. Baptizing with water, John the Baptist, okay. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many of the hands. Didn't, didn't John the Baptist say that? Remember he said that? That was in uh, the book of... Luke, certainly. Well, it was in the book of Luke. And he says that, and I don't think it was the only place, but he said that I baptize you in, in water, but there's, going, there's coming somebody whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. All right. Now, please understand that this Jesus, the Lord here, well, John the Baptist, okay, through the inspiration of God's Spirit, was talking about a one-time event. It's a one-time event. It is the promise of the Father, and the promise of the Father was going to come, apparently, within a number of days. Okay? It's not a continuing event. It's an event that happened. I'm not saying it happened in a second, but there was a certain chunk of time it was supposed to happen, then it was done. Okay? That, that's very important. And when therefore they were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Also a very important question. See, nothing is written in Scripture here by... Just coincidence. It's not like the Lord said, yeah, throw that in if you want to. Okay. Everything is there on purpose. The restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Well, what's the answer? Well, they're still waiting. We're still waiting for that. So that's why I say it's in the postponement period. The Jews rejected Christ, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, as their Messiah. And therefore, um, he's, he's extended his coming again. Then he says that he, that he reinforces that in verse 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. I don't care what Jehovah's Witnesses say. I don't care what Harold Camping says. You can't know that. Then, he, then we mention verse 8, But you shall receive power. Okay, so he tells us what's going to go on in the post postmodern uh, post period, and in particular this power. So he says when this happens, when the promise of the Father happens, they'll be endowed with a certain measure of power. And that power will be to, to be a, a, a testimony. Okay, and then he was taken up, in verse 9, out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. We would assume these be angels, right? Which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up in the heaven? Why were they gazing up in the heaven? What reason? Why were they standing there just looking up? Well, I think one thing for sure. I mean, if you saw somebody just float up into the air, that's a, that's a remarkable event. So just the physical remarkability of that event would have caused them to gawk, gaze. All right? Then angels appear. We might gaze at that too, perhaps. This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, 
shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So he's just like he came up, in fact, in the same place, he's going to come back down again. Zechariah 14 tells us that he's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives and there's going to be a great earthquake. So in very much the same way and in very much the same place and the very same person is going to come back again. So what do they do? They returned on Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, Sabbath, the day's journey. So there it is. And when they were come in, they were up into the upper room. There abode both Peter, and then we give a listing of the apostles. And they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. All right, so what did they do? Why did they return there? Because Jesus said, go and wait for the promise of the Father. It will be not many days hence. Incidentally, uh, we, we know, it's, it's, he tells us here, that Christ was on earth after he had ascended for how many days? Well, we know it was 40 days. They were 10 days up in the room. So that is 40 plus 10. Those of you who are particularly proficient in mathematics will come up to what conclusion? The sum? Outstanding. The word 50 in the Greek essentially is Pentecost, 50 days. The Passover meal was, it was about the time that, that, uh, that Christ resurrected, I mean the resurrection, not the ascension. I said the ascension, the resurrection. And so he, he was resurrected, then he worked there for 40 days, then he ascended, then 10 days later they were there. So 40 days after the resurrection, he was working among them, then 10 days. So in the Jewish um, feast season, there were three feasts during this time. There was a feast of Passover, all right? Then there was a first feast of first fruits, and then there was a feast of Pentecost, all right? So this miraculous event, which is actually prophesied for us in Ezekiel 36, talks about the Joel, the book of Joel, talks about this rendering of God's spirit among the, among the people. And he talks about this. In fact, Peter himself says that this is the promise given to us by the prophet Joel, isn't it, I think? Maybe I have the name of the prophet wrong. But he says that this is going to happen. So th this did happen, of course. And um, <coughs> so they, they, uh, th this was all prophesied before, but it was 50 days. The, point, the important thing is that it was, it was, it was during the feast, the feast season. It was about a, less, a little less than two months season there, where they had Passover, and then they had the, the Feast of First Fruits. It was the harvest season, and then they had Pentecost. All right, so what were they supposed to do during Pentecost? Well, I'll go to that in just a minute. Okay, so we were reading through verse 14. All right, so they're waiting for the promise of the Father, which he said was going, was going to come not many days hence. Then uh, they choose the next apostle from the death of um, Judas. They choose Matthias. By the way, in Greek, that means uh, uh, disciple. That's what that means. And then, look what it says. Let me reread verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not, Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. All right. So apparently this promise of the Father and what the Lord told them that was going to be not many days hence when he ascended came to pass in Acts chapter 2. Right. So this was a, an event. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the ascension of Christ. These are some of the highlights of the book of Acts. This is not apparently the only time he ascended. In John chapter 20, we have Mary wanting to uh, embrace, we think, the Lord after she called him uh, Rabbi Rabboni, my, my teacher in, in Hebrew. And then he said, don't touch me because I haven't sent it to my father. Well, apparently it wasn't, he, it, he couldn't have gotten, to, I don't know for what reason, I don't know, but he did not allow people to touch him. Then we see later on in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, that Thomas, uh, did touch the Lord, right? placed his finger in, his, in the hand. So something happened between when Mary couldn't touch him and Thomas was touching him. We also know in the book of John, 1 John, that uh, we have seen and we have heard and we have touched and we have all of this. So he's talking about the risen Christ and having actually um, you know, embraced him and touched him. So they were eyewitnesses. They could say they, they touched something. And I think that's the point of all of that, was that he, wasn't, he, wasn't, he didn't rise again figuratively. He actually had a body. And so, of course, that is a very, very, very unique, very unique and particular Christian um, hallmark, you could say. We don't serve somebody dead. Right? He's alive. That makes really all the difference, doesn't it? According to Paul, 
according to our own thinking, according to everything, that's what makes all the difference. And so it was so very important to affirm that truth. And so they did. The book of Acts then uh, shows the carrying out of that, <clears throat> of the coming of God's Spirit and this promise of the Father. Okay, um, so uh, he apparently ascended. Uh, and then he, we see him ascending again in Acts chapter 1. So apparently there were two ascensions. Now we know what happened to uh, Judas. I think you remember, right? He, he, he well, he jumped off somewhere and his guts fell out. <laughs> his insides, his entrails. I've seen some roadkill that looks similar. So I, I think that that's probably what it was there. <laughs> I've got a great, I've got a great story about roadkill. Remind me. I have to keep going. I probably not going to have time, but remind me. All right. What were the requirements for the replacement of Judas? All right. Well, there had to be somebody baptized of John. Look at verse 22 of Acts, beginning from the baptism of John. It had to be somebody that was present during the ministry of Christ. Verse 21, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So somebody that was there. It had to be present, had seen Christ after his resurrection. That in verse 22. Um, and the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be witness of us of his resurrection. And then witnessed the ascension, perhaps, too, went in and out among us, he says there. So perhaps also going in and out among us uh, would be also a witness of the ascension. All right. Um, because if it's, if it's the, a witness of the Lord who had gone in and out, maybe that in and out means the ascension there. So that's the case. They would have been witnesses of the ascension also. So the person that they were going to pick. Now, this isn't by all means everybody that was called apostle. Okay, there was a time period for that, we know that, but the Lord also designated some people to write his word that could also be called, certainly his disciples at least. Uh, Paul also was called an apostle, we know that, and he didn't fulfill all of those requirements. So they weren't the only people in, in the Bible called apostles. We do know that there was a certain time period for that uh, time of the apostles, and it coincided with the giving of God's word. So there are no apostles today for that reason. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Feast of Pentecost now. I already mentioned that uh, the Lord was 50 days after, the, after Passover and uh, 40 days after his resurrection, which happened right at Passover, and then uh, 10 days in the upper room, so approximately 50 days. This would, been, would have coincided with the Feast of Pentecost. All right, so if it did, the question might be asked, why is it, was it important for the coming of the Holy Spirit to, to occur at the time of the exact at the Jewish feast day of Pentecost. All right, so let's answer that. Let's look at what these three feasts picture. I mentioned before that there's kind of a feast season that is pictured here. We have Passover. Right? What does that symbolize? See, all of the Jewish um, feasts um, have their correspondence in, in, in Christianity. All right, so uh, we we know that it has something to do with Christ. We know that the temple was destroyed. The Lord put a stamp of approval on the church here in Acts chapter 2. We know that Judaism was gone away with. In a very abrupt way, there is no temple. Without temple, you can't have Judaism. So now, the Lord has placed his stamp of approval and he works through the church. We know that. And so, and, and so they used to meet on Saturday. Now they meet on Sunday. They used to meet in the temple. Now they meet in the church. All right? That kind of thing. So we know there's, there is that. In the book of Leviticus chapter 23, we have an idea of what happened during Pentecost. All right, so here we have the number of 50 days. In verse 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days. After 50 days, the priests were directed to uh, offer, bring to your habitations two wave loaves or two tenth deals of flour. In other words, they were supposed to bake two loaves of bread. All right, and they will be bacon with leaven. And they are the first fruits unto the Lord. Okay, so they, this was an idea, and the idea was of two loaves of bread. Why two? Well, a lot of people have said that it represents, of course, being the church age now, the Jews and the Gentiles both being included into the covenant promise. Mm, I don't know that I tend necessarily to believe that. After all, the Gentiles were always included, really, if we, if we believe that uh, Nineveh was an example of that. And so, uh, but I do believe that it represents the completion, <coughs> excuse me, of a God's word. In Leviticus 23, 16 through 18, 
we see uh, it says there, so we talked about the wave loaves, and then it says, and ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs. So it wasn't just that it was bread. He offer, also offered seven lambs. So what, how does that correspond to the day of Pentecost? Well, I think seven is the number of completion. The working of the Holy Spirit and the signs of God's Spirit here for Jew and Gentile alike uh, were uh, through God's Spirit. And so he, the, this was until the God's Word was completed. And so the idea of completion of God's Word and the idea of seven lambs being offered on the day of Pentecost, I think, cor cor correspond. All right. So let's, let's, make, let's, make it, let's make a correlation. Passover, the Old Testament Passover, we know that commemorated the death of the firstborn. So how does that carry over into Christianity? Obviously. The death of the firstborn. Can you answer that? Yeah, the death of Christ, of course. Yeah. So, and then first fruits, what does that represent? Now the first fruits, if you remember, were, okay, there's three parts to the Jewish harvest. There was the first fruits, and then there's the, the main harvest, and then there are the gleanings. All right, so this would also correspond with the resurrections. Okay, who is the first fruits of the resurrection? Well, Paul himself designated that to be Christ. Then you have the main resurrection, and then there are the gleanings. The book of Ruth gives us a good example here. The gleanings were something that, the, the, like, like the corners of the field, or that which was dropped, the handfuls of purpose he told it to give the Ruth. These would be the gleanings, okay, whatever was left over after the main harvest. Well, this would represent the resurrections during the tribulation. So, we, we know the first fruits then deals with the resurrection, in, in particular the resurrection of Christ. So whereas Passover corresponds to the death of Christ, the first fruits corresponds to the resurrection, the Pentecost corresponds to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And we've mentioned that already. All right, so what, what are some of the, uh, the uh, miracles during, during Pentecost? And we know that <clears throat> These miracles were unprecedented, and I mentioned that it was for a, a certain time period. I think that's clearly brought out in Scripture, and it's important that we understand that this sort of miraculous outpouring of God's power through His Spirit is not for today, because we have the completion of God's Word. Again, I will refer you to the last verses of the book of Mark that says that these were signs following the confirmation of God's Word. We also know that in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says that that which is in part will be done away. Uh, and in, in, when that which is perfect is come or complete, that which is in part shall be done away. So when the Bible is completed, that which was in part dealing with the, the special uh, endowing of, of God's Spirit here will be done away. We also have the evidence that this was for the Jews. It was in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19, where we see this come about, but the Jewish people were always referred to there. All right, so what are some of the miraculous events? There was a, a sound of, now, ask yourself, that does this happen in Pentecostal services today? Is there a sound of a rushing, mighty wind? I don't know. I've never been to one. I have heard a lady on the phone speak in tongues before. She called the church as she was looking for a Baptist church that speaks tongues. And after I told her, it's a Baptist church, uh, she, although nowadays, who knows? But um, I said, no, nope, don't do that here. And so she said, well, I believe in speaking in tongues. I said, okay, well, we, we just don't do that. Here. And then she said this, do you want to hear it? At that point, my curiosity peaked. And, and, and I, I just, it came out and I said, sure. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. So she started going off in tongues. And I'm sitting there listening to it. And it was amazing. It would, if I didn't know any better, it sounded like another language. And so the secretary came in and I said, hey, come here, listen to this. And she's going and she's listening to it. And she goes, what is that? I'll tell you in a minute. So then she gets done. And uh, I said, well, and I didn't know, what do you say? Because she's done. And I was like, I think I said, are you finished now? Is, is that, yep. I said, okay, well, I hope you find what you're looking for. Click. All right. So I, I have heard, uh, I don't think it was that abrupt, but I'm, I was kind, I think, like always. So there's a sound of mighty rush. Now, there was no rushing wind. There wasn't before she said that, none of that. What about the cloven tongues of fire sitting on top of their heads? That doesn't happen either, does it? How can you call it a resurgence of what happened in, in, in the day of Pentecost and none of this is accompanying it? And then they did speak in other tongues. Now, what this, was this a miraculous event? Yes, it was. Right? But it was for, for the confirmation of God's word and it was a sign unto the, to the Jewish people. <clears throat> Okay, um, now, Peter, he, he have his sermon here. 
So after this happens, uh, then he mentions, he tells them basically in the sermon. So we're on chapter two now, by the way. Okay. Did I, I, I went right into chapter two without telling you, didn't I? I think so. The day of Pentecost. Acts chapter two, the day of Pentecost. The message. Okay. So what kind of message did Peter um, give? Well, he gave a message that uh, revealed the purpose by which this was happening. So these people are looking at these miraculous events, and they may ask themselves, you yeah, why is this going on? And so they were amazed and astounded. And by the way, they were all Jews. It tells us in chapter 2 there were Jews of Cappadocia and, and Dalmatia and all of that. So they were Jewish people. And from the day of Pentecost, we know that later on they would have gone to their regions and spread the gospel there. And so this is when Paul came through. He saw people gathered together praying in a beach, for example, or... Um, whatever, and it wasn't just because of what happened in Pentecost and because of the ministry of John the Baptist. So um, they, he, he told them why. He says it was prophesied before. The prof, was it the prophet Joel? I wanted to make sure that I know he's abroad. Galileans, uh huh, yep, yep. Oh, Peter standing of 11, and you know, hearken to these men this day. Yep. Joel, there it is, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. All right, so he tells them through the scripture there, that what was happening here was what Joel had said about, about the, um, your daughter shall dream dreams and your son shall do these things. And all of those, what he's saying is there was going to be miraculous events that would happen. So Peter there is saying that what Joel was talking about is now being fulfilled. All right, so, um, and what happened? Well, they were convicted. 3,000 people were saved. <clears throat> now you say, why don't we see things like this today? Did Jesus see this many people saved at once. No, but remember that the, 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 I don't know if playing field is the right thing, but the people's hearts were being prepared since the time of John the Baptist. So for all this time, the message of repentance and acceptance, the, um, the, the ministry then of, uh, of Christ, of course, and all that controversy, the controversy, and all of this, and it happened at a feast time where all the Jews were at one place because they were during the feast season. So it happened during the time where all the Jews had traveled and come to one place. So a lot of things were put into place for there to be a big harvest of souls. All right? um, however, each of them were, were reached, it could say, individually before this time. All right, then um, we have verse 38. Now let's get into this one. All right, so how did the crowds respond? Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. So there's conviction. This is the ministry of God's Spirit. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There you go. Baptism is required for salvation. Okay, since they're not going to strike that off of this video, I better explain myself. Okay, um, is the emphasis on belief or baptism? Look at verse 41. And they that gladly received his word were baptized. What does verse 41 tell us then? That the baptism was after salvation and not before. Does verse 41 clearly bring that out? There, there's a process. If we don't follow that, then later on in Acts chapter 8, where Philip was dealing with the eunuch, he said, the eunuch told him, uh, th so I think Philip asked him, do you believe what you read? And he said, <clears throat> oh, then the, then the eunuch said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? What did um, Philip say? He says, if you believe. If you believe, you can. So it was conditional, wasn't it? What is baptism conditional upon? What is it? Go on, say it, please. Belief, okay, or salvation. So salvation goes clearly in the Bible, always. Baptism came before, uh, excuse me, after salvation. All right. uh, even Paul himself. So here's the argument. Even in Acts chapter 2 here, the emphasis is on belief, and certainly belief before baptism. We see that example with, um, all the way through the book of Acts, and I use the example of Philip. Thirdly, in uh, 1, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's go there. Verse 12. <clears throat> Oh, let's see. Now, I beseech you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing. At verse 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. 
and I baptize also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. Now look what he says in verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So what, according to what Paul is saying here, if that is uh, couched in the understanding that baptism saves you, then apparently God did not send Paul to save people. You see that? Because he sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And he's also making a very clear distinction, isn't he? A very clear distinction. In fact, he's saying that baptism is not part of the gospel. I'll read it again. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Apparently, he's, he's, uh, he's playing baptism with the preaching of the gospel. It's not even included in the preaching of the gospel. And if Paul uh, saw all these people saved without baptism, then apparently baptism has nothing to do with salvation. So that's very strong evidence. But I think uh, one of the strongest evidence is found in verse 38 of Acts chapter 2 itself. And it deals with grammar. All right, so here's a grammar lesson. All right, so he says, repent and be, be baptized. Okay, and then there's a bunch of other things for the remission of sins and all that. And then it says, and ye... Is it repent ye? Repent, just repent. Okay, be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission is, and ye shall receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and ye shall receive. Okay. <clears throat> and this is where understanding of the original languages comes into play and is very important. This is why we want you to have that if you're going to be a pastoral theology major. Anybody, really, but in particular, all of you. We have commands here. There's one. There's another one. And then we have this uh, future. Okay? Repent, be baptized. All right, now, in English, what, uh, what, what commands? What, what is always the, the person receiving the command? What person is that? It's always in the, either the first, second, or third person. Commands are always in the... No, no, no. <laughs> What's the subject of every imperative sentence? You, which is? Second person. Okay. English. Okay. <laughs> now you're talking Greek. Okay. So we have repent. All right. So in Greek, however, you have a third person command, which is, it's hard really to, to show that in English. We don't really have a third person. It's weird. How do you do a third person command? Because we're, also, we're so used to you. And so in, in, the New, in the New Testament, sometimes it comes out as let, let him. You ever hear that before? Let him do this, let him do that. That's how the King James translators translated a third person command. All right, so this, this is a second person command. This is second person plural. I'm, I'm going to make it real. I'm going to make it as simple as I can. And I want you to see something. So that's second person plural. In other words, ye. In the Old English, it would be ye as opposed to you. This would be singular. And this is plural. This is a second person plural. So he's talking to a group of people. It says, repent ye, and you could say, let him be baptized. This is an active command. What I mean by an active command is that the people being addressed are the ones being commanded. All right? This is a passive command. Let them be baptized. Okay? So in the first command, the people being spoken to are the ones who are supposed to do it. That is repent. And the second command is being done on them. Be baptized. Everybody see that? Okay, so this is passive. All right, so this is second person, plural. This is third person, singular. And it's passive. Passive. All right, this one's active. All right, I'm, I'm not here trying to give you a Greek lesson, but, but I think it's important that you see this. Repent, second person, ye. And be he that, is, he that repents, let him be baptized, passive. And what's this one? Which is what person? Singular. It's back to second person plural, right? And this is all you sh ye shall receive. Okay, now this is not a command, however it is the future, but a second person. So the subject of that one, a second person, shall receive is the future. So, do you see what we're, we're saying here? What then, according to person, is unique to receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost? Is it repentance or is it being baptized? Repentance. Do you see that? And not being baptized. 
So this swap in the Greek between a second person plural um, active command and a third person singular passive command to the results being in second person is very important because in Greek it's showing this correlation between here, second person, ye, and not here. So in the Greek then we see more clearly that baptism is not included in the reception of, of, of the Holy Spirit, but repentance is. You follow that? Because of the, cor the correlation of person there. I tried to make that abundantly clear. I probably didn't do a good job, but I think so. What, what we can say then is that, well, person is important. So um, he's addressing everybody. And then the one that repents is to be baptized. However, the, the, those of you that do repent will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see that now? Kind of a better So maybe it's better said, all of you repent and let him, the one who is baptized, be baptized because of the forgiveness of sins. And all of you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Word order in Greek is not very important because of the very distinct, the very distinct distinction between persons and all of that. Word order isn't as important. In English it is. All right, but the King James translators were true to the Greek, and so that's why they put it in the word order the Greek did. Okay, it was a formal translation. Okay, I, didn't, I didn't mean to get into all that translation stuff, but, but I do think that you can see that. One, you can see that this, this idea of belief and not baptism is linked to the reception of the Holy Ghost. Everybody see that? And then secondly, you see the importance of studying the original languages. Do you see that? Okay. <laughs> if you're going to be teaching these things at any... But I, anyway, so I think that... That, that's a plug for that one. There we go. But I do think it helps us very much to uh, do away with this idea that, like the Church of Christ will say, who are the water baptism regenerationists of our day, would use this verse clearly. It, now, Church of Christ maybe isn't as strong here, but in Tennessee they were. And so I was confronted with this many, many times. And, of course, they are the water baptismal regenerationists. And so they would use Acts 2.38 undoubtedly every time to show that baptism is required for salvation. Okay, hopefully I, it's abundantly clear it cannot be. Okay, any questions there? All right, Acts chapters 3 and 4. We're going to title th these chapters Power. <clears throat> Remember in Acts 1.8, he said, You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost will come, is come unto you, and then you'll be witnesses. Well, part of that power uh, that we see manifest in the in the uh, first church in the in the in the, in the church here uh, caused them to do a lot of different things. All right, so we're going to put the power to do one, two, three, four, five things. Okay, five five things that they were empowered to do here. Okay, and this is Acts chapter three and four. One of the things they were, had the power to do is the power to purify or to heal. Now, these are all P words, so don't get, don't get lost in the, uh, what do you call it, uh, acrostic. Is it acrostic where you see these? Alliteration. Alliteration, yeah. Sorry, you're right. And acrostic is where you use all the letters of a word. Is that right? Okay, sorry. You're right. I was wrong. There's the power to purify, but what we mean is heal. All right, look at uh, verses 1 and 2. I like these verses here. And, the, and, and we're going to discuss a little bit how tremendous this miracle really was. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb. Okay, this man, if he was lame from his mother's womb, what does that tell you? R regarding his injuries as opposed to maybe somebody else. Like right now, John Malinga can't walk very well. But before yesterday, he could walk decent. <laughs> it's a bit of a strut. No, I'm kidding. But, but uh, he was able to walk, and now he can't. So he's lame. <laughs> right? Joseph, after this morning, he's lame. He could walk just fine, and now he can't walk so well. However, what is the difference between them and this person? Well, this person never did walk. All right, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now, who's seeing Peter and John? Now, I, I, this really goes to my heart, to be honest with you, just the humbleness of this man. Um, how can you... That's very humble. Right? He had to sit at the temple and beg. 
for money. And whenever somebody looked at him, he would look up expecting to get something. That's a, that's a pretty bad condition, isn't it? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, and he said, look on us. So the, the man, so Peter said, look, look at us. And so he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something from them. I imagine he put some kind of container maybe up like that. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But he says, such as I have, I give to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so what did this man do? Now he says, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now there were a lot of people there. And immediately, think about this miracle. Immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, if we were to... Uh, if we were to come up to Joseph, for example, right now, and all of a sudden he started walking fine, we might say to ourselves, ah, you were a faker, right? <laughs> Obviously, we're just messing around, or John for that matter. Because it wouldn't be hard for, for us to say, well, you know, because he knew how to walk beforehand. But this man never, ever walked. So, and they, this was not the only time, undoubtedly, they sat in front of this gate. So think about this miracle in a physical way. You've seen babies begin to walk, maybe? And they kind of, you know, they're trying, you can tell their brain is trying to figure out the motions. I forget how many muscles are involved in walking or even standing for that matter. But their brain is trying to figure it out. And so they kind of stumble and they fall like that. You say get up and all this sort of thing. All right. This man never went through that process. His brain had no idea what muscles are used to walk. No clue. No idea. And his muscles were never used to sustain his weight ever in his life. Ever. Ever since he was born. So now you begin to understand this, this miracle. Not only were his, his ankle, it says his ankle bones, and, and really everything that's involved in standing and walking had immediately received strength, but his brain was given at one time all of the information necessary immediately to get up and walk. He'd never walked before. How do you know how to do it? Because God instantly gave him that information. I, I think about that as amazing. It's amazing to me. Man, of course, it amazed them, of course. But what a gift. So then what did he do? Uh, he said he leaped. He leaping up, stood and walked, entered with them into the temple. Walking, leaping. Wow. That's power. Praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he that sat for alms at the beautiful gate. It's amazing. Amazing the power of God there. It's a, just an incredible thing. So they're, they're, they're all in the temple there and just amazed at what happened. They had power. They had power to do these things. So, that's one thing. They had power to purify or to heal. They had the power to preach. We know in chapter 3 here, they were, <clears throat> Peter, after this miracle, preached the message. And the message really dealt heavily on the resurrection. A lot of them were Jews, and because the Jews had put Christ to death, um, the preaching dealt heavily with the resurrection. The same person you put to death was alive now. He's not dead. You tried to stamp it out, but he's not dead. You put him to death, but he's not dead. So I preach these things. <clears throat> and uh, so... <clears throat> Alright, so they had power to purify or to heal, power to preach, and they had power in persecution. They were willing to go through this. In fact, they found joy in it. This is in chapter 4. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead and laid hands on them <coughs> excuse me, and put them in, in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of them was about 5,000 people. Again, they, you have to remember Jerusalem was filled with, with Jewish people. Now they're seeing miracles. They had been prepared through the ministry of John the Baptist. They had been prepared through the ministry of Christ. And all the miraculous things that happened in Christ's ministry, they heard about these things. They're coming to, and they, they hear about cloven tongues of fire and speaking in different languages. There are a lot of signs, a lot of things during this time that would help the people to believe. And this is why so many people were saved. <clears throat> but they were arrested. They were thrown in the temple. They were held in the temple overnight. Probably that part of the temple that Herod built, that fortress, because it was a prison. But 5,000 people believed. They had power and persecution. They were persecuted, but that, that only made it, I don't want to use the word worse, but it only increased the power. So they have power to heal, power to preach, power in persecution, power to praise. Look at verse 24. 
Uh, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. They had power to praise. You know that you can praise directed by God's Spirit, and, you should, and we should pray directed by God's Spirit. This is power directed praise. Power directed prayer. We see that in verse, uh, look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Uh, and then grace was upon them all. So we see power. power. So again, that's why I like to say the acts of the Holy Spirit. We see that transition period between Judaism and Christianity in Acts chapter 1 in the, in the, in the working of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. And then we see power. And then real quick, Acts chapter 5, we see opposition. This is Ananias and Sapphira. Just a couple of things to be uh, brought out. What exactly was their sin? Was it in the tithe? Were they robbing God? Is that what their sin was? No. They weren't taking away any offerings either. They were offering. They were going above and beyond their tithe. They were offering. It wasn't that. So what was the sin? <clears throat> it was pride. They regarded man. Uh, Peter tells them that they sinned against the Holy Ghost. So again, the power of God's Spirit. The, the, um, the seriousness of lying is brought out here, isn't it? One of the things we know about the rendering of, of when, when a people are more filled with God's Spirit is that there's a very, very uh, accentuated sensitivity to sin. That is certainly one of the <coughs> hallmarks of that. And instead of just saying, oh, well, I didn't read my Bible again, and oh, well, I was tired through that sermon again, and just making excuses for it, there'll be another one. When God's Spirit begins to work, you, there's a heightened sense of that, that, that that's wrong. And, and, the, and, and, and a heightened sense of having offended God. And so we see that here. <clears throat> and who did, who did, in fact, who did Peter say filled the heart of uh, Ananias? Satan. That's a heightened sense. Right? Would we think it's that big of a deal for somebody to say they offered this much and didn't? We, I don't know. To me, it's kind of like it's not the end of the world. But when, when, when God's Spirit is working, that kind of thing is going to stifle and quench the Spirit. And so it's a very, very, very accentuated and important thing. It becomes all of a sudden important if you want to live with God's power and the power of God's Spirit. All right, then his wife comes in about three hours later, says the same thing. Notice that I think it's important. She was given an opportunity. He was given an opportunity. When they asked them how much, he was, they were giving him an opportunity to be truthful. Her also. <clears throat> so that was, we could say, opposition from within. From within the ranks in the church, there was opposition. That, I think, is the worst kind. And then there's opposition from without. Well, the Sadducees and, and the priests, and the, they, they incarcerated them. They put them back in jail again, and uh, they tried to decide what to do with them. And Gamaliel comes out and says, well, just like Judas and, and uh, Thaddeus, uh, if it is a work of God, it will be shown eventually. And so God directed all of that. They were let go. What did they do? We should obey God rather than man. They kept teaching. They insisted on the work. In verse 42 there it says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. They simply did what they were supposed to do. So we see the acts of the Holy Spirit. What is God's Spirit doing? It's, he's working among this people. And when He works, people either get right or, or it goes bad for them. And that's what we want. We want it in our, in our churches. We want for God's Spirit to work, and we don't want to quench that Spirit. And like it says, I believe in 1 Thessalonians 5, quench not the Spirit. We see this working of God's Spirit. We'll uh, continue to see this in the book of Acts uh, the next time that, that we meet. There is no assignment for next week, and so we'll stop at this point.